allow us to have services uh, in spite of what's going on outside for the dry roof, for the friends and family who gather here each week and just give you praise. Lord, we lift up our loved ones who are suffering, who are struggling, who are grieving. But we just ask, ask for your comfort, for your peace, for your healing, for your care to be given in each and every situation. Whether it be for those who are traveling, for those who are facing surgery, who are coming out of it, whether it's medical treatment, whether it's a, a broken split marriage, whether it's families who, 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 are, who are struggling with rebellious kids or, or, or feuding parents. Lord, we know that you are able to do more than we can ask or imagine according to your glorious riches. So, Lord, help us to trust you. Help us to place our faith in you. Help us to bring our prayers and petitions before you. To pray believing not only that you can, but that you will answer us. Lord, show us your faith. Show us your miracles. Show us your love. And help us to embrace it, to embrace you. Lord, we thank you for the gift of giving. As we have the opportunity to worship you now with the financial ministry of the church. Not just here at Calvary, but our missionaries as well. We ask your blessing upon them. And as we take up this offering, that it will bring glory and honor to you. That it will be our way of saying to you, thank you for what you've given. And I want to participate in the ongoing work of Jesus Christ around the world, starting right here at Calvary. Father, we thank you again this morning for your Holy Spirit who dwells in us and who is among us. And that we invite your presence today to speak to our hearts and minds. Challenge us with the gospel. Energize us to be motivated to share the gospel. And Father, secure us and comfort us so that as we go and share, Father, that we will maintain the energy, we will maintain the comfort, that we will maintain the uh, the presence that's necessary to keep on going. Help us not to grow weary in doing good, but to continue the good work that you've called us to. And now, Lord, as we continue to worship you, our prayer is that you and you alone will be glorified, that your name will be lifted up, that you will be made great, that those of us who walk with you will be challenged to do better, and those who don't know you yet will come to know you today. Lord, be glorified among us. We ask this in Jesus' name. Ushers, will you come at this time? Mm -hmm.
says, if my people, if my people, we look around us today and we might blame the shape that the world is in on all the atheists out there, all the other groups who deny the Lord Jesus and live against the word of God. But God's word says, if my people who are called by my name, by a Christian here this morning. Yeah. Call themselves by the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face. And what? Turn from their wicked ways. I believe the, world, the reason why the world is in the shape it's in today is because the church has failed. The church has fallen down on the job. They've given in to the ways of the world and let the world mold and shape them rather than being molders and shapers of the world. God is calling the church to repentance. To get down on their face before God and to humbly confess that they're turning away from the Lord God and from His word. Come back to the truth of God. Claim his righteousness and live for God. If my people will humble themselves and pray. If my people, which are called by my name, shall humble themselves, shall humble and pray. If my people which are called by my name shall see my face and turn
We've been working toward uh, a sermon, or what's going to end up being sermons now, uh, on Pentecost and the coming day uh, of as we celebrate the New Testament, the Holy Spirit. From the Old Testament would be the day of the giving of the law, 50 days following Passover, comes Pentecost. Uh, we have, as we uh, begin in Acts chapter 1, Jesus speaking to the disciples and telling them uh, that when power comes upon them, that they will become his witnesses in Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria and to the uttermost parts of the world. They have named the, uh, uh, their number of 12. They have kept... Uh, the number together, they added Matthias. We looked at that last time uh, that we spoke about out of Acts. And now we come to chapter 2. And I'm hoping to move uh, more quickly through this than, than I'm able to. I was hoping to move more quickly through this than I'm able to. But what the, what I want, where I want to get to this morning, and, I, and you'll notice that I'm going to move kind of quick through the stuff that you may think is the most important, to get to the sermon portion and the, or the response portion of those who are affected by the power of God. When we get affected by the power of God, a response is necessary. A response is not optional. I remember when I was first getting started preaching, I was told by one of the preaching professors that uh, he, he, would, he told his own story of doing a revival series. I probably have shared this with you before, but after four days of powerful preaching and no one coming to the front to respond to a revival service, uh, a, a, a very thoughtful church member came up and said, don't be uh, saddened by the fact that no one has responded to your wonderful messages. And he says, that's not the case at all. He said, everybody who's been in the room has responded. Just none of them have come to the front. <coughs> and he was teaching us that Anytime a message is presented, anytime God presents himself to us, whether it's in church or at home in prayer, Bible study, maybe it's a radio program or a friend who has brought God into your life, into your thoughts, there's a response that's given. We are always responding to God. Sometimes we're responding by rejection. Sometimes we're responding by apathy. Sometimes we're responding by disobedience and sin. But sometimes we respond with obedience, with repentance, with acceptance, with a, a, a public uh, presentation of who God is. But we're always responding in some way to God. So as I begin, I want you to be thinking about your response. When God reveals Himself to you, what does He want from you? He wants something different from me than He's going to want from you. And He's going to want something different from you than He wants from your spouse or your child or the person sitting next to you. But He wants something from every one of us. What does God want from you in response this morning? The song we just sang talked about honoring God, recognizing God, repenting to God, in Him healing our life, a response is necessary. Join me in chapter 2 as we set up the, the scenario as God gives us the truth of, of what is transpiring here to get to a response moment. Acts chapter 2, the receiving of, the giving of, and receiving of the Holy Spirit here at Pentecost. It says, when the day of Pentecost had arrived, they were all together in one place. And suddenly a sound like that of a violent rushing wind came from heaven. And it filled the whole house where they were staying. And tongues like flames of fire were divided and appeared to them and rested on each one of them. And then they were all filled with the Holy Spirit. And they began to speak in different languages as the Spirit gave them ability for speech. There were Jews living in Jerusalem, devout men from every nation under heaven. When the sound occurred, the multitude came together and was confused because each one heard them speaking in his own language. And they were astounded and amazed, saying, Look, aren't, these, aren't all these who are speaking Galileans? How is it that we hear each of us in our own native language? Parthians and Medes and uh, Elamites and those who live in Mesopotamia and Judea in Cappadocia, Pontus, and Asia, uh, uh, 
Egypt, Pamphylia, and Egypt, and parts of Libya near Serene, visitors from Rome, both Jews and proselytes, Cretans and Arabs. We hear them speaking in our own languages the magnificent acts of God. And they were all astounded and perplexed and saying to one another, what could this be? But some sneered and said they were full of new wine. We'll come back and pick up at that point in a few minutes. But let's just take a moment and think through what has just transpired. See, Jesus went to the cross following Passover. And He died and He rose again. He walked for 40 days with His disciples. Teaching them. And sharing with them the truth of who He is. And He says to them as He prepares to ascend into heaven a couple of different things. Um, he gives them the great commission to go and make disciples of all nations. He also gives them the Acts 1-8 commission. When power comes upon you, you'll be my witnesses in Judea and in Jerusalem, Judea, and Samaria, to the uttermost parts of the world. And then Jesus ascends to the right hand of the Father. He leaves their presence. Now He's told them in advance that, that you need to go and you need to stay together. You need to be in prayer because I promised you the Holy Spirit. One who's, who's going to come, a comforter. In John 14 and 16, He talks about this comforter who's going to come and be a part of it. Now He didn't tell them when and when. In fact, He says, you won't know when, but you need to be prepared. And so the church of the day, as it was becoming known, came together. We see that in Acts chapter 1. They're together in prayer. Constantly praying. Seeking the Lord that they're in unity. Praying. We see them choose Matthias. We see them gather back together here at the start of chapter 2. It says, when the day of Pentecost had arrived, they were together in one place. They were enjoying being together. They were waiting on what Christ had promised. They weren't understanding it. They didn't know it. They, they didn't know this was even going to be the time of it. But they're together for a purpose and in a particular place for Pentecost. One of the Old Testament festivals. Pentecost was the celebration of Moses giving the law to the Israelites. God gave the law to Moses. Moses gave it to the Israelites. It's the recognition, the celebration of God's revelation of Himself through the law. That's why they're together. They're together because Jesus said so, be together. But they're together for the celebration of Pentecost. Pentecost wasn't originally, though it was in God's plan, not in human understanding, about the Holy Spirit. In fact, some, as we read through the New Testament, didn't even know there was a Holy Spirit until God presents Himself to them. And so they're gathered together in this upper room, celebrate, preparing to celebrate Pentecost, the receiving of the law, and God begins to do something amazing. This weekend we were at man camp and it was a lot of fun. We had a, had, had, a, had a lot of sprinkling and rain on and off. We were able to do most of the things that we had uh, set out to do. Yesterday afternoon, about 1.30, we were out doing our games. It's our, it's our game time. My group was uh, on, on the, the ropes course, which is more than just ropes. But at this particular moment, we're standing there. The, the kids had, had gotten on this log, and they had to line up by birthday. So they had to like walk in front of each other, behind each other, crawl over each other without falling off to get lined up by birthdays. When the kids finished, they get the dads on the log. They're going to line us up by facial hair. I was at the end of the line. I was going to let have facial hair. <laughs> and it, as this is getting started, we're all standing on the line, we're getting our instructions, and we begin to see something happen. You see, all day, pretty much for two days, it had rained on us in short periods, usually drizzle type of rain. One of my favorite things about Indiana is watching the storms come in. You can see it happen. And you can see behind the storm that's on, on top of you, the light behind it. So you knew it would just be a quick, gentle rain and it would move on past and you could continue your stuff. And there's hope in that. You don't panic. But not this time. About 1.30 yesterday, the winds picked up. We're in Monrovia, not too far west, but west of here. The winds picked up. The clouds are moving in. As we looked up into the sky, we only saw one thing. Darkness. And there was no light. 
beyond the darkness. It was darkness and more darkness. And the drizzle began. And we're trying to get ourselves on this log according to the amount of facial hair we have. It wasn't hair on the chest, not on this one, though we did win that award. Our, our, our director, our leader for this event was, was Rick Porter, who, who runs the camp out there and the maintenance stuff. And Rick says, guys, just a second. And he takes off and runs to his truck and puts on his raincoat. Rick's preached here before, and he told lies on me. Just so you know, when Rick comes back, this is true. I'm a, I'm a, I'm a you know, eye for an eye here. This is a true story. Rick goes to his raincoat and comes back out. He's prepared to stay all afternoon in the rain. The rest of us don't have that luxury, and we start getting pounded on. This gentle rain that had been coming and going was no longer. God opened up the floodgates of heaven. I was looking for the ark. I thought Noah was coming. It just started pouring on us. Us men are on the slippery log trying to get ourselves in order, and Rick's not letting us quit. And there's no hope behind the storm because it's just darkness. And our boys begin to shiver. And about 30 seconds later, they've all disappeared. It's just the men on the log with Rick and boys kind of leaving the scene. And finally, we convince him we've got to go. We knew the storm was coming because the winds picked up. We knew something was about to change because the light was leaving and darkness was coming. These, this group is gathered in this upper room. Well, they're gathered in this place, it says. And they've been praying together faithfully for at least 10 days. For we know that's when Jesus ascended. We know Jesus told them to gather together and wait for this gift that was to come. And they're gathered in this place. And all of a sudden, something begins to change. And the scripture says it was like a wind. It doesn't say it was a wind. It said it was like a wind that filled the house. <coughs> and suddenly, verse 2, a sound like that of a violent rushing wind came from heaven and it filled the whole house where they were staying. Something's about to change. God's got their attention. The Holy Spirit is about to be given to them. They are about to receive the gift that God has promised. Now, gift giving and receiving is a lot of fun. It's exciting. We love to get the gift, don't we? We know what's coming. Anybody got a birthday today or coming up? What are you going to get? You're going to get a gift, right? You're excited about the gift. It's coming. They know something has changed. They know something is coming. They know that uh, uh, my mic's out. They know this. <laughs> They know that something's coming. And we, and we lost the whole board, Patrick. Whole board's down. Yeah, this happened to us the other day. You know what? <coughs> they didn't need a board in the first church. All they needed was the Holy Spirit. Red. Try this one. Hey, we got red. Okay. I got yellow. <laughs> I color blind too. God doesn't care. <laughs> so the wind has come and has filled the house. There's anticipation. There is expectation. They don't know what this gift is going to be, but I believe that they, that, that they see it coming. So the wind fills the house. And then these, what looks like or appears to be, uh, tongues of flame come down and rest upon each of the, uh, of the disciples who are gathered in this house. And it says, all of them began to speak as the Spirit led them to. And when this wind rushed in and changed this house, did you notice the response of the community? Check this out. It says that the, the wind came through the whole house where they're staying, and the tongues and flames were divided and appeared and rested upon them. The Holy Spirit, it's, it's symbolic of the Holy Spirit coming to, to dwell in them. It says that they were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in different languages as the Spirit gave them ability for speech. Now, I believe this is a unique one-time situation. We don't see this happening over and over again throughout the New Testament. God is sending His Holy Spirit, who we now have the privilege of having inherited upon salvation. But this is His first group indwelling of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit comes upon these people, and it says He fills them, and they're speaking as He gives them ability. And there were Jews living in Jerusalem. 
devout men from every nation under heaven. And when the sound occurred, the multitude came together, heard them speaking in his own language, and they were astounded. What happened? When this rushing wind filled the house, and people began to declare that the works of God, the wonders of God, the entire community showed up. The entire community showed up when God got a hold of his people who were gathered together in his name, awaiting his gift. And when the gift arrived, began to exercise the gift they were given, each according to the call of the Holy Spirit. And the whole community showed up to see what was going on. See, I believe God's going to do a revival. There's going to be a church somewhere that God's going to get a hold of. They're going to get together and they're going to start praying. They're going to be unified in the Spirit of God. And God's going to show up among them and they're going to get excited about what God's doing. And they're going to start being biblical. They're going to start telling people about what God's doing. They're going to respond to the movement of God in their lives. And they're going to get so excited that people from the community are going to start asking questions. They're going to start showing up. And I believe that there's an opportunity that's going to take place. I don't know where it's going to take place. I believe it's going to take place. I believe it probably takes place about every week somewhere. If we don't preach this word, it can happen here. People are going to start showing up and asking questions. But I believe the movement will end. I believe the movement will end right there in that congregation where it begins. Because of the faithlessness. God's people. I believe because of the lack of responsiveness of God's people. I believe because of the way we inward analyze the things of God rather than outwardly expressing the things of God. Opportunity is going to present itself and we're going to miss the opportunity. I believe God wants great revival to break out. I believe He wants to do things like He did in the book of Acts. But I believe his people have got to be ready to receive that which he's promised. See, the Holy Spirit, I believe, dwells in us as Christians. I believe we've been filled with the Holy Spirit. But I don't believe we express the love of God the way we're called to. The whole community showed up. It says they were astounded and amazed, saying, look, aren't all these who are speaking Galileans? But yet we hear it in our own native languages. In verse 12 he says, How could this be? They were astounded and perplexed. But some sneered. He said they were full of new wine. See, God did what he said he was going to do. He replaced the giving of the law, old Pentecost, the new Pentecost, the giving of the Holy Spirit. God did what he said he was going to do. Jesus said, I'm going to go prepare a place for you. Am I going to prepare a place for you? I'm going to come back so that you may be praying. But while I'm up there, don't worry. Don't let your minds wander. Don't get all excited. Because I'm going to send one of my very own nature, my very own essence. I'm going to send the Comforter, the Counselor, the Holy Spirit. And He's going to take care of things while I'm gone. In fact, He's going to take up residence inside of you. He will abide in you when the time comes. So I'm going to go and do what I've got to do. So that when you get to heaven, I'm ready to receive you. For where I am, you will also be. But in the meantime, you go to Jerusalem and you wait. And you pray. And you wait. In verse 1, 1 8, Acts 1 8, it says, And when the power has come upon you. In chapter 2, the power has fallen upon the people. And the people respond in faithfulness. And the whole community shows up to see what's going on. And here's what Peter does. Let's keep going. Verse 14. Here's what Peter does. Peter stood up with the eleven. And he raised his voice. And he proclaimed to them. Jewish men. And all you residents of Jerusalem. Let this be known to you. And pay attention to my words. For these people are not drunk, as you suppose, since it's only nine in the morning. On the contrary, this is what is spoken 
through the prophet Joel. We're going to get to that prophecy in just a minute before we get there. This is Peter having been filled with the Holy Spirit, standing up. Remember Peter? Yeah, let's just do a little review on Peter. Peter was first one out of the boat. What happened when Peter jumped out of the boat? He sank because he took his eyes off Jesus. When Jesus is taken to the to, to trial, where's Peter go? He goes outside to watch, does he? And what happens when uh, he gets approached? Aren't you one of those uh, Galilean fishermen? Weren't you with Jesus? Peter denies him three times before the rooster crows. But now, the Holy Spirit has fallen upon a group of disciples who are praying together, seeking the face of God, expecting the gift that Jesus has promised, not knowing what the gift is going to be or understanding what it possibly could be, that it would be the presence of God in their own lives. The presence of God now has shown up in their lives and the Holy Spirit, the person of God, dwells inside of them. And Peter stands up. And did you catch what happened? When Peter stood up, the eleven stood with him and Peter didn't fall. When Peter stood up, the eleven stood with him and Peter gave a sermon. When Peter stood up this time, Peter didn't stand alone. Part of the problem with the church is when God gets a hold of somebody, the rest of the church makes they hightail to the back door and don't want to be associated with him anymore. We got a problem when our Christian leaders on the national scene show up, stand up, and speak up. We deny them. We separate ourselves from them and say, we're not a part of who they are. They don't speak for me. And we allow them to fall flat on their face because there's no one undergirding them. When Moses went to the mountaintop and the great battle broke out and he held his staff over his head and the Israelites were winning, all is good. But when Moses got tired and his hands began to fall, the Israelites began to get whipped. But what happened? His friends showed up, lifted his arms, held the staff up high, and God had a victory. we got to get together here, guys. Not just Calvary Baptist Church. I think we walk in unity for the most part. we got to walk together as a nation of Christians. We got to start supporting our brothers and sisters. We got to stop beating up those who walk with Jesus and start standing together for the glory of God. God's called us to stand together. Peter stood up, and when the eleven stood with him, he stood tall and firm. There's something there. I hope you didn't miss that. There's something there. When we stand together, who can stand against us? Nobody. But divided, according to the Scripture. When Jesus says, uh, I, can't, I, I can't serve bells above and God because a, a man divided will fall. We've got to learn to stand together. When the Holy Spirit came upon them, they all got courage. They all got courage together. And Peter began to preach the prophecy of Joel. This is what the Scripture said through the prophet Joel. And it will be in the last day, says God, that I will pour out my Holy Spirit on all humanity. And he just did. And your sons and your daughters will prophesy. They will speak forth the truth. Your sons and daughters will speak forth the truth when the Holy Spirit comes upon them. When God's Spirit rests, we got to speak. When he, when, he, when he touches us, we got to touch others. He says, your young men will see visions. Your old men will dream dreams. And I will even pour out my spirit on the male and female slaves in those days. No one's left out of the possibility of knowing God. No one's left out of the possibility of inheriting the gift of God. No one is left out who wants to be a part of what God is doing. Even the male and female slaves will receive the Holy Spirit. That's you and me. That's us Gentiles. That's us who are separated out. If we put our hearts together with Jesus Christ, not only will we be saved, but we will inherit the gift of the Holy Spirit who will dwell inside of us, who then requires us to give a response back to God. Every, every reach God makes toward us, there's a response required on our part to reach back. When He reaches toward us with the salvation message, He expects us to reach back and say, Yes, I receive you. When He reaches back with the blessing of the Holy Spirit, He expects us to reach back with the response, to tell somebody that Jesus loves us, to, to believe in our heart and confess with their mouth, then you will be saved. That's what's required to, to, to share the good news. Even the slaves can receive this and be a part of this blessing. 
I will even pour out my, my spirit on my male and female slaves in those days, and they will prophesy, they will speak forth the truth. Verse 19, and I will display wonders in the heaven above and signs on earth below, and blood and fire and cloud of smoke, and the sun will be turned to darkness, and the moon to blood, before the great and remarkable day of the Lord comes. And verse 21, then whoever calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Whosoever calls on the name of the Lord, who's whosoever? Whosoever is whosoever, isn't it? It's anyone who will call upon the name of the Lord. It's all who will call upon the name of the Lord will be saved. John 3.16 is real simple, isn't it? For God so loved the world that whosoever believes in His Son will not perish but have eternal life in heaven. It's pretty simple. Whosoever, whoever chooses to believe in Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior will be saved. Uh, our pastor friend over in Pendleton, Chris Hubler, lost his 19-year-old son, Elijah, last week or two weeks ago. Had the funeral out this past week. Alice and I went over on Monday to the visitation. At the hospital, before they take, took him off the ventilator, uh, 25 people were saved by the pro uh, proclamation of John 3.16. Whosoever will believe that Jesus is the Son of God. Chris said that during the course of that week, they could verify over 100 people who had been saved prior to the funeral. God was busy at work. I don't know how many were saved at the funeral, but reports of salvations continue to, to, to flow. This is what Chris was saying at the visitation. He's a pastor. He said, I preached this message. I believe this message. I have understood the love of God for the lost. He said, but God has taught me something that I did not know. He said, now experientially, I understand what it means to lose a son salvation of others. God took Elijah and God saved over a hundred people in this past That's the love of the Father for whosoever called him to You see, God has given us an opportunity through the life, the death, the resurrection, the new life in Jesus Christ. He has given us an opportunity to be whosoever, but to also help others be whosoever. I believe Pentecost to us today is just as important as it was to them. It may be to the modern Christian the greatest of the miracles of God. Salvation comes through Jesus Christ. I, I did that. You have to have Christmas and the birth of Christ. You have to have Easter and the resurrection. But I am so thankful for transformation. That I am recreated. A new creature in Christ Jesus. That doesn't happen without the Holy Spirit. That doesn't happen without God's work of regeneration. That doesn't happen without this miracle of new life. That he's offered to whosoever will believe upon him. And Peter, when he stands up to preach, has a love standing with him. And he's being heard miraculously as he's speaking miraculously. And lives are being transformed. And over 3,000 will be saved in this one day. Revival begins in Jerusalem when the Spirit of God begins to show up. And the people of God begin to make some noise about God. And all those things they had heard in the past, all those things they have seen and observed, all those things they have witnessed and been taught that were once a mystery to them have come together in the full knowledge through the gift of wisdom and understanding the Holy Spirit brings. And they are so moved and motivated that they can't be kept quiet anymore. And now they are driven to the point of response. And Peter stands and he says, as the prophets have spoken, so it is. And now is the time, now is the time for whosoever to believe and to be saved. When power comes upon you, you will be my witnesses. I just want you to flip back one page. Acts chapter 1, verse 8. 
I hope you have a pen. I hope you write your Bibles. Highlight it. Pencil it in. I want you to circle, underline, square, mark. Uh, I don't want you to miss this one word. See, in Acts 1 day, we we're told that when the power comes upon them, you will. I want you to mark that word will. I know it's probably time for me to, to end. I'm getting hot, so I'm going to end early today. You mark the word will, and I'm going to end early, okay? You mark the word will, and I'm going to end early. You will be my disciples, my witnesses. You will be my witnesses. You will be my witnesses. So church, you only, there's only two categories this morning. Only two categories. If the power of God has come upon you in the person of the Holy Spirit, then you're a Christian. If you're a Christian, you will, you will be my witnesses. That means you will do the work of Christ. You will tell somebody about Jesus. Now here's the problem. If you've never told me about my Jesus, if you've never been his witness, I don't get to judge you here. I want you to go before the throne of God and say, Am I a Christian? Because when the power comes upon you, you will be his witness. And if you've not been his witness, let me just ask you, do you think you can be his child? If you refuse to be his witness? There's only two categories. Either you're his witness, which means you're his child, or you need to be whosoever. So that God can save you. Through the blood of Jesus. So that you can be redeemed and reborn and rejuvenated in the power of the work of the Holy Spirit. If you're in Christ Jesus, if you're in that other group, you're in one of two places. Again, only two options. So you're either not with Jesus and you need to be with Jesus, and God's giving you a free gift of salvation through Jesus Christ because He loves you because you're whosoever. Or you're in Christ Jesus. If you're in Christ Jesus, you're either in obedience or disobedience. If you're testifying, if you're witnessing, if you're walking, fulfilling the good works that God's prepared in, in advance for you to do, then you're walking in obedience and bless you. Otherwise, you're in disobedience. If you're in disobedience, you need to repent and get right with God and ask God to forgive you of your sins, cleanse you of all unrighteousness, not for salvation. Because you've already been saved, if that's the case. But to become right for usefulness so that you can be His witness. Because we're only given really one command in all of Scripture. To love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, and soul. And if you do the first commandment, you will do the second commandment. Love others as you love yourself. And if you do the first commandment, if you love the Lord Jesus with all your heart, mind, and soul, you will respond to Jesus in an affirmity. Yes, Lord, I will do whatever you ask me to do. And what he's asked us to do is to tell people about him. To encourage people who know him. To further his kingdom. Yes, I know this is a heavy message. And when the Holy Spirit comes, he's a heavy. He is God. And God's message is heavy. And God's message it, it is tough. Because it means we've got to be changed. But it's also easy. It's also easy in this. That we don't ever do it in our own power. We don't ever walk alone. Jesus says, bring me your burdens and take up mine. Our burdens are heavy. His is light. If we choose to walk with Jesus, if we become whosoever, either today, if, you, if you're becoming whosoever, you need to say to Jesus, I'm a sinner. Forgive me my sins. I repent and I choose to follow you from this day forward. The scripture says, when you believe in your heart and confess your mouth, you will be saved. If you're in Christ Jesus, then you either need to repent and say, Lord, I've not been obedient to you, and I choose to be obedient, so forgive me. I will be your witness, as you have commanded. Or you can say to God, thank you for making me useful. I know I'm not perfect, and I can still do better, so forgive me where I failed you, but help me to continue to do that which you've already called me to do. Either way, anyway, you've got a response to that. You see, the coming of the Holy Spirit at Pentecost, in my mind, was all about our response. God did all the work of presentation. He did all the work of salvation. He's doing all the work of redemption. But we've got to make a response to God. 
A response is always required to Almighty God. It's as clear as I can be. How do you need to respond to God this morning? I'm going to pray for you and for me, for all of us together. I want you to ask God as you stand before him, where do you stand? Let's pray. Father, we love you. We thank you for the privilege of being in your house. We thank you for helping us to know you through your work. We thank you for revealing yourself to us through your spirit. We thank you for the salvation that comes through your son. We thank you that you are but one God, three in one. That we're not worshiping a, a, a separation of deity here, but, but just you, Lord. And now as we come together for response, Lord, my prayer is that you've made it clear where we stand. Do we stand with you in salvation? Or do we need to be part of whosoever believes will be saved? For part of whosoever believes will be saved, give us the courage to share that good news with one another. Give us the courage to step out and say, today was my day. I've become a part of the family of God. I've received the Holy Spirit who will bring me peace and comfort, who will give me knowledge and wisdom, who will make it possible for me to be a witness of Jesus Christ to the world around me. If we're in Christ Jesus, Lord, some of us need to repent and say to the Lord, forgive me for I've not stood with Peter, but I have tore him down and I have cast him out. I have not stood with my brothers and sisters, but I have stood quietly away. And today I repent and I choose to get into the game and I choose to be a part of the team and I choose to be on fire for Jesus. Father, for those who walk with you, though we know we're not perfect and we fail you every day, we ask for that continued faithfulness that we would want to be more like you. And when we fail you, give us the, the courage to repent as well. And when we, when we please you, Father, help us to do it even more. Help us be for your glory, not for ours. Help us to be thankful and to bring you praise and honor and glory for the good things that you did. And today, Lord, as we close and we all make a response, Lord, may it be our, the prayer of our hearts that you and you alone would be glorified. This would not be a decision for me or about me, but a decision for you that will bring you glory and honor. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. You stand with me? And as we sing, will you respond? The Lord is calling for a response. What's he saying to you?
we have the privilege of being a part of that, not on that day, but on this day. So as you go, be that witness. I believe the rest of that verse says wherever you are. I believe that's what it means. Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and other parts. I believe it means wherever you are. Be that witness as you come and go. Tell somebody the good news of Jesus Christ. Invite them back to Calvary, to your church. If you're not part of Calvary, take them with you wherever you go. Don't take our people with you. Come on back. Yeah. <laughs> take people to the feet of Jesus. That's what's important. As you go, say, God, let pray for you. Father God, we love you. We thank you for the privilege of being in your house. Bless your people as they come and go and help them to be a witness wherever they may be. That you would be glorified. That your will would be done. And that Jesus' name will be made great. Lord, expand your kingdom. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.